we've uh, we've left it until about quarter past to see if uh, other people are going to come in. Obviously, if uh, if there are any latecomers, we'll we'll give them a warm welcome anyway. Um, there's a few seats right at the front. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks everyone uh, for coming. Welcome to um, to the meeting. Um, just a few words on uh, who we are, and uh, if you haven't sort of come into contact with us before. Um, so we are um, the International Marxist Tendency, uh, and so we're an a international political organization. Um, we're active in several different countries around the world, and uh, our aim is sort of to, to intervene in uh, labor and, um, and student movements uh, internationally. Um, and in that sense, put, put forward our perspective on uh, current situations, current struggles, um, and also give our support in, uh, in sort of progressive movements that are building and, um, and stand beside um, uh, sort of anti-Islamophobia, anti anti-Semitism, uh, racism, and um, all these different uh, forms of oppression as such. So hence uh, the reason why sort of we, we're holding this meeting tonight, um, which uh, most of you are probably aware of, that is quite a controversial topic nowadays, um, uh, the topic of sort of uh, the, the rise of the right uh, in Europe especially and internationally, um, the rise of um, Islamophobia and, uh, and especially in Europe we've seen... Um, We've seen a couple terrorist attacks, such as uh, the Charlie Abdu shootings and um, the Tunis Bardo Museum, which was also attacked. And we can see how these events definitely um, increase the, the 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 support for sort of anti-Islamic um, political organizations or just sort of breed racism as such. Um, so it's it's uh, it's very important to um, to understand um, the origins really of uh, of these uh, movements of these uh, perspectives that are building up. Um, understand the the social base that they have um, in order to really um, understand and, and enable us to organize and understand how best to fight these forces. I'd say so. Hence why we're. We're having a meeting on um, on the topic of uh, sort of the rise of the far right, Islamophobia, and um, this party Pegida, which has been uh, which has demonstrated in uh, in several cities and is due to come to London on Saturday. Um, so uh, I've got Ben here, who is uh, he is a member of the executive committee of the Marxist Student Federation which is another sort of uh, means by which we um, organize ourselves. Um, it was founded by members of the International Marxist Tendency. Um, and Ben, if you'd like to just uh, mention a few things about the Marxist Student Federation. Yeah, um, so the Marxist Student Federation, as many of you know, uh, is organized in 25 universities around the country and uh, growing, and uh, has played a role already in fighting fascism and anti-fascist movements. Uh, and in educating people, as Emily says, uh, on the question of what is fascism, what is the far right, where do they come from, uh, and therefore what is the best way to fight against them. So the Marxist Student Federation has meetings around the country to discuss theoretical questions like this, but then also in to intervene in the movement. So recently in Newcastle, uh, Pegida demonstrated there last month, it was, well, a couple of months ago now. Um, and uh, the Marxist Society in uh, Newcastle organised an intervention there. They held a meeting to discuss uh, a, a meeting very much like this, to be honest, a planning meeting, and also one to discuss the political uh, elements of, of what was going on, how to fight against it. Actually, the article that you've got on the leaflets there, uh, the basis of that was an article produced by the Newcastle Marxist Society off the back of that discussion. Understanding the political background is very important for, for a proper education and a proper fight back. And students actually, in general, uh, can, a lot of us will speak to students uh, about what's going on, about this demo on Saturday, but then in the future there are going to be other demonstrations of this kind. And when we're speaking to students, we should remember that they can play a very important role, they can be a very important force in fighting the far right, in fighting fascism and racism and so on. Because if there's one thing you can say about students in, across Britain, but also particularly in London, it's that there's a lot of international students, uh, and uh, including many from uh, Muslim backgrounds, 
um, and uh, obviously a well, whole range, but that's not obviously limited to just the students. London in particular, but Britain in general. The whole of society is very multicultural. And so for young people, students in particular, they are, uh, they are inherently kind of used to a multicultural uh, environment. And they therefore are automatically opposed to racist uh, ideas, racist ideology, far-right ideas and so on. Um, couple that with the attacks that are taking place against students and young people more generally, tuition fees, rents, cuts to benefits, these kind of things. And it becomes very clear to young people who the real enemy actually is. It's not the people you study with, the people you work alongside, the people you live with day to day. It's the government. It's the 1% who are amassing the, the wealth and the government who are, who are making uh, everybody else pay for the crisis. So it becomes very, a class perspective develops very easily among students and among young people. And we should remember this when we're talking to them and building for demonstrations like this, building uh, for meetings like this and discussing the politics behind it. So the Marxist Student Federation and the Mar all the Marxist societies in general uh, must show their solidarity, do show their solidarity with uh, the demo on Saturday, uh, with obviously everything the IMT is doing around, around the world to organise anti-fascist, anti-racist uh, things. And uh, we will be there with our physical presence to oppose the fascists physically, also with, uh, with our political arguments and our political ideas to, to demonstrate to uh, people who could potentially fall under the sway of these, uh, of these kind of organisations that actually the solution to not enough jobs, not enough money, uh, all these kind of things, not enough housing, the solution is not anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric, but the solution is, uh, is revolutionary socialism. Thanks, Ben. Um, thanks for um, introducing the Marxist Student Federation. And um, I'd like to just uh, add to that and say as well that um, the Marxist Student Federation has a, a very large base amongst the universities, but that doesn't mean that we can't sort of appeal to, to um, younger students in secondary schools as well. Um, and it sort of gives us that opportunity to, um, to reach out to the younger, younger generations as well. Um, and obviously having the Marxist Student Federation and the International Marxist Tendency working together gives that link between the labor movement and the student movement. Um, in sort of a way to, to, to build a stronger base of support, let's say. Um, so we have uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Hamid, who is uh, the, um, an, one of the editors of uh, Marxist.com, which if you haven't uh, seen before, I invite, strongly recommend that you have a look at uh, Marxist.com, which is the international website of the International Marxist Tendency. Um, and so he's here tonight to speak on uh, Pegida um, and sort of the, the rise of the far right and uh, um, uh, Islamophobia in, uh, in Europe and internationally. Um, I think you're going to speak for about uh, 40, 50 minutes or so. And uh, yeah, and uh, we'll have time for, for a discussion after that. Uh, discussion on sort of what, what, what will be brought up by Hamid and then um, some time at the end to, to think more practically about the, the counter demonstration on Saturday, uh, how many of you are thinking of attending, how we can build for it and sort of uh, unite our forces if, an, if any of you are involved in, uh, in other political organisations if you want to bring that to the table and we can talk about organizing. I'll just bring your attention before I call Hamid to come in. Um, Stella over there has got a sign-up sheet that um, she'll be passing around. Uh, leave your email address, phone number, um, Facebook name if you want to sort of um, just keep up to date with what events we've got. It's also a way for us to um, let you know about Saturday, um, where we will be meeting, sort of a, a way to uh, keep in contact about that. Um, we've got a stall uh, with books that um, the um, publishing company of the international publishing company, publishing house of the international Marxist, Marxist tendency has produced over there and uh, our April paper um, has just come out that I am ripping. 
uh, <laughs> um, invite you all to, to take a look at this. We've got copies on sale for, for a pound, um, or you can support us with two pounds. Um, also, we um, will have sort of a collection um, sort of halfway through the meeting, but mm -hmm. I'll bring your attention to that later. So, Hamid, thank you. Thanks. I'll just uh, stand up so I can see everyone. <coughs> Um, well, um, I mean, one of the themes of this uh, talk is this uh, group Pegida, which, uh, which started off in, um, in the town of Dresden in Germany, where they organize in the months of December and January a series of, uh, of demonstrations which were quite large. The largest one, which happened right after the Charlie Hebdo bombings, I think it attracted around 25,000 uh, people. Now, this, this organization, which is extremely right-wing, clearly anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, uh, very racist uh, tendencies, have been trying to present itself as kind of a very, a very presentable way, or this academic, and the people who argue, and people who bring arguments, and this is, you know, established, uh, well-dressed uh, people in, in, in suits, or maybe not in suits, but uh, they can speak well and so on. Uh, but, the, but in reality, I think there's not much difference between this group and, uh, and the rest of the far right, which is lumping criminal elements. And I was just looking, before this meeting, I was just looking into uh, this Lutz Bachmann, is his name, the guy who set up Pegida. I was just looking a bit into his background. I mean, this is in his Wikipedia page, so it's not even... Doesn't even take long, long to find. But uh, this Louis Bachmann in the 90s, before he set up Pegida, he was charged, well, throughout his life, he was charged and convicted of burglary, drunk driving, sale of cocaine, and assault. And he was sentenced to several years in prison, after which he fled from uh, Germany, fled to South Africa, uh, where he lived for a couple of years, until they found him and deported him back to Germany. So talking about criminal immigrants, this guy has not, does not have a good track record to talk about this. Uh, but this is, this is exactly what the whole uh, right wing is, is really about, it's lumping criminal, criminal uh, elements uh, with an extremely um, racist outlook. And you might, you might, if you read the Pegida program, it's actually it's covered up quite well. You know, obviously there's the whole general line of oh, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, but they try to kind of walk about it as you know, trying to not be convicted of it in court. Uh, but if you, but but the things that this guy has been saying on Facebook and so on, sympathizing with the Ku Klux Klan, with the Nazis and so on, him and, and other people in the leadership of Pegida, it's clear what these people are about. And I think really what what's um, the main, uh, the main point to make about Pegida is that it's, it's been able to kind of become a focal point for the extreme right wing of Europe. Uh, in Dresden, it, found, it, it gained a certain size well, due, to, due, to, due to different reasons. But in reality, it hasn't been that big in, in, the, in, the rest of, uh, in the rest of Europe or in Germany. Um, in fact, this guy, uh, Louis Bachmann, says, oh, there's a media conspiracy about, uh, against Pegida. I would say... There is a media conspiracy behind Pegida. I mean, if you, read, if you read the newspapers about Germany in December and January, it was all Pegida, Pegida, this is mass movement of people who are dissatisfied with Islam and Muslims, and people just had enough, and the governments are not doing anything about the real, real wishes of the masses. That, that was not the reality of it. In fact, uh, everywhere except Dresden, although in Dresden there was, a, I think, a 10,000-strong counter-demonstration, in every other city except Dresden, the, the demonstrations far outnumbered the, these, uh, these uh, groups. And, and uh, completely contrary to the um, picture that the media was trying to paint of these, you know, the new man in German politics and European politics, you know, this established gentleman. If you look at all the, like, if you really look at the demonstra demonstrators, it was, it was hooligans. Nazis and different kinds of uh, fascists who, for once, put their own infighting uh, aside and, 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 and came on. And in fact, the counter demonstrations was far far bigger. There was a more than a hundred thousand people demonstrating in Germany alone against Pegida in different in different time, towns. 
In Berlin, there was 4,000 people against uh, 400. Uh, and uh, I had some figures here. In Munich, 20,000 people uh, demonstrated against. And Munich is a quite a conservative, you know, Bayern is, a, is a Bavaria is a quite a conservative part of uh, Germany. In Leipzig, 30,000 people came out. So this is the, this is the real situation uh, about the, you know the reality of, of Pegida. But uh, there is a there is a, another reality which which is very real is that for the past 20 years, the whole rhetoric in the media and in established politics, if you want to, against immigrants and especially against uh, Muslims have, come, have, have developed to such a degree that I, I think a lot of times, if you change the word Muslim with Jew, it would not be very different from uh, writings that you could find across Europe in the, in the 30s. And it's, it's just so blatant uh, and then these people keep uh, doing it, and, uh, and all in the name of democracy, and you know they uh, they <laughs> they, uh, they do this and say Muslims are anti-Semites. I mean, it's like if you just scratch a little bit under their arguments, it makes no sense. And I'll get to that in, in, in a little bit. A few weeks ago, and this is not just Pegida, obviously. This is what all the established parties have been doing. All the established parties in Europe, in the West, uh, have been kind of piling onto this. Uh, this, uh, this, this, this mood and trying to whip up a mood of hysteria against, uh, uh, against Muslims who are actually quite different to each other. I mean, it's not one, <laughs> one entity at all. But, uh, but let, let's let that be. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, Theresa May, Theresa, or Theresa? Theresa. Theresa. Theresa May made this speech called Our Britain, Our Values, where she said that, you know, when people come to Britain, they have to build on our values of democracy and respect and tolerance and we fight and we sacrifice. But, uh, but if you really look at it, what are British values? Like what, is, what is British values? They talk about terrorists. They talk about Islamic State being barbaric. I, I agree the Islamic State is a barbaric monster. But how many people have the Islamic State killed? That's, I mean, if we just take the maximum amount we can imagine. 50,000 people? I mean, I don't think it's, the figure is above that. How many people have British imperialism killed in Iraq over the past, uh, past decade? How many people do you think? There's a new, res there's a new uh, research paper coming out which says that in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and Pakistan, a conservative estimate is that 1.3 million people have been killed. 1.3 million people. I mean, that's a tenth of London being exterminated. People losing their families, their children, whole families being completely uh, uh, destroyed, crushed under bombs. You know, and, there's, and it's not finished. They, what, 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 did the, what did the invasion in Iraq do? First, what was the first thing the invasion in Iraq do? Was to bomb the infrastructure. Water, electricity, roads. I mean, health care, uh, education, these are secondary matters now. A luxury just to have electricity and water, clean water, a clean food, uh, uh, you know, a healthy food is a, or even food at all, is a luxury. And then health care, education, all those things, those are completely uh, irrelevant for, for many, many millions of people. That's, that's the raw material for fund fundamentalism right there. That's what's created the raw material for for hundreds of, for millions of people who, who will never get a job, who are doomed to just wander around uh, and not being able to use their, their productive uh, capacity and just rot and just wait to die. You know? And those people, they're not even counted, obviously, in, 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 in these figures. And also, and at the same time, that's, I mean, where does immigration come? It's not because people, oh, I really want to move to Britain and leave everything that I have my family, my history, everything, my culture. Even in the, even, even the worst countries to live in, people, people actually feel they belong there and they want to stay there. People do not leave their countries unless they're absolutely forced to. It doesn't matter if living standards are higher, uh, even like for, the, for the vast, vast majority, uh, at least. And people come because of, uh, because of uh, wars and these things. Uh, there was a guy on TV, on Danish TV, I was watching the other day, I know Danish. Yes, um, he, he was a poet. He said, and he was actually arguing this, this case. And he said, my grandmother fled from uh, from Palestine to Jordan, and then 
my mother, my parents fled from, uh, what was it, Jordan to Lebanon. Oh no, they fled from, 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 uh, from Lebanon, to, to, from Jordan to, to Denmark. And we grew up in these uh, refugee camps in Denmark, which is basically what a, what a lot of these ghettos and these, uh, these satellite towns that we have all around uh, Europe. I think it's less in, in Britain probably. But in Germany and France and Scandinavia, you have these towns which has just been built outside the towns in the middle of a jungle or woods or whatever. Uh, for basically for these, the, the, the poorest uh, uh, of society. And when they see, again, bombings and wars and so on, that's, that's what causes uh, the hatred that you see against, uh, against uh, imperialism, which is what... Um, which is what a lot of these fundamental, Islamic fundamentalists uh, uh, kind of tap into. That's, that's the values of Britain. It's murder, it's killing, it's death. That's what Britain, British imperialism has been thread, spreading throughout the world. Uh, and how about the, the, the other values, you know, clean and not, not being corrupt? I mean, that's, I don't understand how people can say these things with a straight face when you have one corruption scandal after another. I mean, what, what was these, uh, these MPs a couple of weeks ago in Britain? This MP was saying, was basically taking a bribe from a Chinese businessman. And when they asked him, why are you taking him? He said, oh, well, 65000 a year, you can't live off that. You can't live off that. Never mind that a lot of, uh, a lot of Brits live for less than a, uh, than, a, than a tenth of that. And they do. Uh, in terrible conditions. Corruption, embezzlement, just outright stealing—you know, uh, not tax dodging. That's that's the values of, of, of the British establishment and pedophilia. I mean, it's been it's been shown that this is not—you know, first it was Jimmy Savile. Oh, he was a disgusting person. Obviously, we only found out after he was dead. He was a disgusting person, and then oh, one other person. Oh no, th those are two really disgusting individuals. But now it's clear that this disease. Is, has, has infiltrated, or is, is, a, is a component part of the British uh, bourgeoisie, of the British establ establishment, of these nice terrorists in suits who are a thousand times more violent and, and barbaric than, than their counterparts in, uh, with turbans. That's the, that's the values that, that these people have. Um, they've been stealing and, and killing, murdering, and at the same time, uh, imposing the, the harshest austerity measures on normal, uh, on, on normal people. Was in, in, in Britain, we used to have the world, like the model of the welfare state, the NHS. You know, there was everyone talking, the NHS. Anyone could go in. Even if you weren't a Brit, you go in and get world-class treatment. Today, NHS is, a, is almost a death trap, you could say. You know, super-resistant bacteria because of, there's, no, there's no funds to clean. <laughs> you know, people, people who, people who, don't, who can't get uh, life-saving treatments. Um, and I mean, there's, I'm not going to go into it, but the stories that you hear from, from, the, from the NHS alone uh, are, are terrible. And I think a lot of people seeing this, seeing, seeing the cuts and the attacks against living standards, against working conditions, against wages, while at the same time these people are lying and stealing and you know, these, these crooks basically uh, ruling a society, a lot of people have become very radicalized. Uh, and people are looking for radical solutions. And I think that's the case throughout Europe. That people feel that something <laughs> radical must be done. And what is the answer that they get from the politicians? When, when you look at any political debate in, uh, in, in Britain, what are the politicians saying? Can anyone here tell me what any politician is really saying. Think about it. Can you, can you, can you remember what, the, what points they're actually trying to make? They're not saying anything. If, we, if you look at debates in Parliament or in the, in the media, it's completely empty. You know? And they're all mimicking each other <laughs> in being more and more empty. They, they're like competing to say less. There's, there's no one giving any solution. Uh, uh, um, except for the far-right nationalists. I would say those are probably the, the main thing that distinguishes these, the, 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 the right nationalist uh, um, tendencies in, in European politics is that they at least give some kind of an answer, some kind of a, 
um, solution um, to to the problems that people face. They say, well, it's, it's the Muslims. Well, that's that's at least something. And they, and they say it in a radical way. They say that we need to have radical measures against the Muslims. And that does uh, resonate with a, with, a, with a layer of people who are, who are, who are looking for, for a way out. Um, but I would say, obviously, this is, this is a completely empty answer. And it's a weak answer, if you really think about it. Because, I mean... Who cut, who cut the NHS? It wasn't, it wasn't immigrants or Muslims or Eastern European people, for, for that matter. Who, who bailed out the banks? Who, I mean, who, who are doing all these uh, disgusting things? Who, are, who, who privatize, who's privatizing the NHS, the education system? Who raised the, the tuition fees? It wasn't Muslims. And it's clear, if you, if you put it out there, uh, if you put these things together, who is the most parasitic elements in this society? There's one tiny, tiny group which is, which is stealing and sucking out far more resources than any of the poor uh, and, and, and the dispossessed uh, can ever do. And what, and what is the punishment that you get? If you, you, know, if you do some social so-called fraud, if you just tweak your paperwork a little bit to, uh, to get a couple of hundred quid more to get by a month, you can get imprisonment. You can get... Taken, you can get your right taken away for having any kind of welfare and, uh, and live in desperation. But if you uh, commit tax fraud for billions of pounds, nothing is going to happen to you. That's literally uh, uh, how, how, how things are. Um, so I think that the arguments uh, against these, these people are quite easy, you know, or the arguments of these people are quite easy to, to tear apart. And also, we have to ask ourselves, since this terrorism, this, this plague of terrorism and Islamism, which is a plague, I would say, it's an extremely reactionary thing. Uh, since it's there, how did it come about? Was this a, is, is this like a component part of the Middle East? Has this always been there? Is this a part of Arab or Muslim culture? Uh, and it's not. It's never been, in fact. Um, if you look at it, Al-Qaeda, who created Al-Qaeda? I mean, the Americans created Al-Qaeda in order to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan and the Sour Revolution, which was a very progressive revolution, in the 60s and 70s in, in, in Afghanistan. In Pakistan, they built the Jamaat Islami against the Pakistani Revolution in, 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 in 68. Uh, in Egypt, which was where they began in the 50s, they built up the Muslim Brotherhood, they funded them, they helped them spread throughout the, throughout the region because they, they, they realized that they were extremely efficient or they were the best fighters they could find against communism and socialism, which was the real tradition of the Middle East, in fact, of, of left-wing nationalism, socialism, communism. That's the real traditions. And these groups were built up by millions of mi billions of dollars being, funded, uh, being pumped into them by the CIA and, and their... Um, and their uh, little minions. Um, in Indonesia, they built up the, the Islamist movement to crush the Communist Party. One million communists were killed. And this, this, was, this was a direct, I mean, it's not even, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's, it's open, uh, you can go in the archives and, and, and look it up, don't believe me. And now, in Syria, who built the Islamic State? Who built the Islamist today in, uh, in, in Syria. Where do they come from? They didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, they had advanced uh, weapons way before, uh, before they, became, they took over Mosul and parts of, uh, of Iraq. Why is that? Again, because millions of dollars were being pumped into them and other groups. They were being trained. They were being helped with logistics. They were being, uh, um, they were being aided in, in many ways in the fight against the Assad regime, which has been the adversary of, of Western imperialism, basically. Not that Assad is, is a progressive dictator at all. Uh, but, but in order to fight him, in order for, to, to protect their own narrow interests, they built up all these groups. They pumped money into them uh, with the aid of Turkey, uh, Jordan, um, Saudi Arabia and, and other Gulf states, which are the close allies of U.S. imperialism and, and British imperialism. 
that's uh, that's they they built the, that monster, and in fact, they're still today. You know, they talk about moderate moderate groups. You know, they don't say moderate what, but just like moderate groups. What does that even mean? I mean if you think about it, they 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 also they're still supporting Islamist groups. The two groups which are officially on the list of groups which are being supported. One is Hazm, although that, that's gone now. I can explain why in a bit. In a bit. Uh, which is a movement which is called the Movement of the Time of Muhammad, which is a, which is an Islamist group. It's an armed wing of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Syria. The other one is called the Syrian Revolution Front, which is a group composing of yeah, a couple of semi-secular, although that's all the name, groups. But mainly groups which until a few months ago were called the Islamic Front. I mean, changing of name maybe helped uh, their, their image in the West, and that's probably why they, why they, uh, they did this. These are the, still the same people that they, they, they support. And if you look at it, they, you know, they talk about this group, Jabhat al-Nusra, in the media, and they're becoming more and more neutral, you know, so-called terrorist group, Jabhat al-Nusra. But Jabhat al-Nusra is the official branch of al-Qaeda in, uh, in, in Syria. And they're giving it passive support, basically. And in fact, Israel, the Israeli state is giving it active support. They, they, uh, covering, giving them aerial coverage when they when they attack uh, Hezbollah and uh, Assad uh, positions. They're treating Jabhat al-Nusra uh, wounded soldiers in Israeli uh, uh, hospitals. And in fact, Netanyahu, you know, who's terrified by the rise of Islamism, went to the hospital and visited these brave freedom fighters from uh, from Syria. Of course, when they were only decapitating people in uh, in Syria, it's, it was a you know, they were freedom fighters and democratic fighters and so on. And now they're suddenly terrible barbaric terrorists because they're actually threatening the, to destabilize the whole region. But, but these, uh, these nice and presentable gentlemen and women forget this. And they talk about democracy. Uh, you know, obviously, the, there's the democracy that they have in the Middle East, which is what I, what I talked about. But then in Europe as well, they have the, the, the guts to talk about democracy. But what is, like, what do they use this for? Is it, oh, in the name of democracy, we'll ban headscarves in, uh, in, uh, in France. So today is, is a crime to wear a certain kind of clothes and get imprisoned in, in, uh, in, in France. In the name of democracy, you can have actually a court case against you without you knowing about it, without you having a right to defend yourself, uh, knowing the evidence, even knowing the sentence, I, I think, you can actually just be taken and put to prison without knowing anything about what's going on. In the name of democracy, they, they, they kidnap people in Europe and bring them to Egypt or Algeria or wherever where they are tortured, and then later on to Guantanamo, where they, in the name of democracy, are taking away all human rights, even the right not to eat. The right to, to read, the right to talk, the right to listen to music or any culture or any kind of human activity that is taken away. All of this in the name of so-called uh, democracy and freedom of speech that they talk about. I mean, first of all, what's freedom of speech? Do you guys have freedom of speech? I mean, you can say what you want, but will you ever be heard? Will, will, will your words ever be mentioned in, in, uh, in, in, in the big media, which is controlled by a tiny, tiny minority? Of course it's not. It's, the, the freedom of speech is, is hollow in, in, in the West and, and, in, and in bourgeois democracy. But not only this, but I would say this, the, the hypocritical way that they use this freedom of speech to take away freedom of speech. You know, you can get, if you say, oh, I'm, I, uh, I am not against the Charlie killings, which I am against. Uh, you can get into prison, and several dozens of people have, in fact, in France, been, been in prison for this. There's no freedom of speech here. If you attack, if you criticize the hypocrisy of these people who claim to be fighting for freedom of speech, you're attacked for being against freedom of speech. So what kind of freedom of speech is that if you can't criticize their freedom of speech? That's, that's no uh, freedom of speech. It's just, it's just a tool, it's just a cover to oppress and to... Um, uh, 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 to discriminate a layer of people who've already been taken away, who, who are already lying down, who already been pushed into submission. And this, and this is used 
as a way to discriminate them uh, further. And that's, again, what, 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 what fertilizes fundamentalism and pushes uh, young people, young radicalized people, uh, in, into, these, into the hands of these uh, uh, fundamentalists. Now, just to say a, bit, uh, a few words about them as well, uh, the, I w obviously they're not better than, uh, than, I mean, they're obviously barbaric, they represent the barbarism of capitalism. They represent the, the open, counter-revolutionary barbarism of capitalism. Now, they claim to be radical, but they're radical as harmless. If you, look at, if you really read into it, they're not proposed to change anything. And they're saying, well, uh, normal people are not fit to make choices, so we should make it for them. That's basically what the bourgeoisie is saying. And they defend the holy right for property. That's basically what, what they're about. And they always unite with the bourgeois, they always unite with the imperialists around one particular issue, to suffocate revolutions. And they've been doing that in one country after another since they were spawned off by, by, by the system itself. Um, they claim to be you know, defenders of these oppressed youth in, in, in Europe, but they don't care about racism, they don't care about uh, discrimination. In fact, they feed off it. And they try to they try to push it, uh, it, it. They try to make this gulf in between Muslim and immigrant youth and and Western youth even wider. But the point is, the point is, who who do who do we have more in common with? I mean, if we just think, if you're a Muslim or a non-Muslim, who do we have more in common with? Uh, another Muslim who prays five times a day in uh, Saudi Arabia. In some, you know, some sultan in some emirate or whatever, is that who you have more, most in common? Or another normal working class youth here who, who doesn't have any religion? Or, or if you're a, a, not a Muslim, who do you have most, most in common with? Cameron? Or, uh, or Mr. Murdoch, who are not Muslims? Or no, normal other, you know, the working class uh, Muslim uh, youth? I think it's, quite, it's a quite simple question, which these people hate. Uh, and they never mention it, obviously, because what they hate mostly is the question of class, is the question of class unity, and that's what they're fighting against, and that's where they unif that's always where they unify with the imperialists, with the right wing, and they lean on each other by attacking each other, by widening this gulf. They they actually lean, lean on each other. What what did the Ebdo murders uh, do? I mean, these this barbaric acts. What was the result? It was it was on the one hand to push people in the hands of the right wing, uh, you know, the French born people into the hands of the right wing. And on the other hand, to, to further isolate the youth, the immigrant youth, the, the, the Muslim youth, uh, and push them towards, towards these um, basement mullahs um, to, to, to exploit. Um, I think what was clear, the, the, this whole thing was extremely clear during the Arab Revolution, where you had all of these people in the same camp. The Islamists, the Democrats, the, the, the right wing, the, the center or whatever, all of them, the, the establishment, the governments, uh, they were all in the same camp against the revolution. While you had at the same time millions of people around the world cheering on uh, the revolution, millions of working class uh, uh, people, cheering along the Egyptian revolution, cheering along the, the, the Tunisian revolution. In Tahrir Square itself, you had hundreds of thousands of people, Christians and Muslims, hand in hand. And you saw, at that instant, all this crap of Islamism and even and nationalism even, for, at least for a while, while that lasted, was severely weakened in the Middle East and in, the, in Europe. And, class con and the class divide in society became clear. You had uh, Obama, Netanyahu, you know, uh, the Grand Mufti of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, all these people in, in, in the same camp. And these nationalists who talk about all oh, the, 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 the Muslims who don't, who don't want democracy and they only want dictatorship and terrorism and barbarism, what were they doing? I remember this uh, Pia Casco, who's the, one of the main uh, nationalist right-wingers in Europe, the Danish People's Party chairman. She was against the, re the revolution because she said, no, 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 no. We, we need the stability in, uh, in, in Egypt. 
So all the time she's saying, oh, Muslims are not democratic. And then when millions of Muslims come out and fight for democracy, she, she goes uh, against them and, sh and, and shows her true nature. Um, the point is that, that what all of this reflects is a reflection of the crisis of capitalism that's, um, that's, that's creating extremely weak regimes by attacking, by destroying living standards, by, um, uh, by basically undermining their own legitimacy. The bourgeoisie are also undermining the legitimacy of their system. Say 20 years ago, uh, during the fall of the Soviet Union, the bourgeoisie was strong. Capitalism was, 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 was quite strong, you can say, relatively. Um, it was enough to be a democrat. That was what they were fighting for, democracy. But now the whole illusion of bourgeois democracy is falling apart. Who can, who can believe, even if people say they believe in it, they would not believe in it the way that people believed in it in the post-war uh, uh, period or after the fall of, uh, of the Soviet uh, Union where there was a boom in the economy. People's lives were generally getting better. And people felt, oh, well, things are going, uh, going well and we can all get along and we can, you know. But now it's no longer, it's no longer that situation. The, the system is in a crisis. It's attacking the population. And, be, and because of that, it's, it's becoming unstable. And that's why some layers of the, of the bourgeoisie realize that this is one of the ways to stabilize uh, the, 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 the regime, to lean on these reactionary uh, movements, um, uh, and, to, and to divert the attention from the real, uh, the real issues, which is uh, the class struggle. Um, yeah, I think I think it, the mass of the population is uh, is furious uh, with 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 the, with the situation, and that goes for every single country in uh, in, in Europe. But the point is, what have the what have the labor leaders been doing? If you look at if you look at uh, Britain alone. You have a situation where the situation is becoming desperate for more and more people. In 2009, I think, you had 50,000 people depending on uh, food banks, basically. This year, you have one million people depending on food banks. In, in Britain, this, this modern, civilized nation. Right? And the situation is only getting worse. It's a desperate situation. People are looking for the, to the traditional leaders the Labour Party and, the, and its leadership. And you see Ed Miliband, you think, what does he say? Nothing. He, I mean, it's, it would be so easy to undermine UKIP. Let's say uh, UKIP, which is, which is, it would be so easy. Just read out the program of UKIP. That's it. Are they actually fighting for welfare? No, they're not. They're fighting against, they're fighting for, uh, for, for capital, for, for tax breaks, uh, for austerity. That's, that's, it's, in a, it's in their program, it's in their writings, it's in their statements. Why doesn't the Labour Party put this forward? Um, because they do not believe, obviously, in, a, in, in, in socialism and, and in the working class. Uh, on the contrary, they go along with the right-wing drift, and they try to, put, they try to overbid the right-wingers. They try to be more right-wing, more rabid, in a responsible way. Than, than the right wingers, than the racists. I, what was this thing you can buy now? Like these five, have you seen it? You can buy five cups on the website of the Labour Party, and one of them is like five pillars of the Labour uh, <laughs> campaign. Right? Uh, I mean, it's pathetic. That's, that's that. This what was it. Didn't say? Uh, immigration control is what one of them uh, one of them says. So. And they talk about integration, you know, that's, the, that's been the buzzword for the past, integrate, you need to integrate. Yes, but integrate into what? The, the vast majority of immigrants into Europe have been integrated in capitalism, in European capitalism, and are being fully exploited and used as cannon fodder, basically, <laughs> against the working class. You've been used to divide the working class, to underbid it, undercut it, being put into extremely bad situations, Extremely, uh, extreme poverty, uh, many of them, and used to underbid and, and drag down uh, the, the, the wages and the living standards of, the, of, of European workers. That integration has been done. 
The task of the labor leaders is to integrate these people into the labor movement, into the unions, not to push them away. And, and that's, that is the last uh, how do you say, building block of fundamentalism. You see, if these leaders came out and put forward a real class position, if they came out and exposed the government, if they came out and exposed the bourgeoisie for their hypocrisy, for their extreme criminal behavior, then all of these things would disappear in a day. Like in, each, in, 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 a, in a Greece, you know, there's a, this, the golden dawn has been built up to be this ma massive thing, this monster golden dawn is taking over. In the first few weeks of the cities of government, when the government was sticking to its program, a very radical program, against austerity, for raising living standards, for fighting against the Troika, for standing up for the Greek people, basically, 90% of Golden Dawn voters said they would support the government. <coughs> that's, that's the solution right there. It's not because there, there's no, you know, we have the Pegida and we have to fight against Pegida. That's clear. We have to fight against Pegida. We have to kick them out uh, on a class basis. But, but we should not uh, build them up to be some bigger than, than they are. The, the main trend in Europe today is a movement to the, re to the left, is a movement against the establishment, is a movement against the status quo, wanting to change. Of course, as long as the labor leaders and the, and the, and the, and the trade union leaders are not showing a way out, then this, this process will be deformed in, in a thousand and one ways. But... but it, it, wherever you see that someone speaks up, someone puts forward, not even a, a, a line, you know, a, a brilliant line, but just someone who tells the truth, someone who says what every, or every single one of these people know, then all of that is swept aside. In, in Spain, Podemos is growing to be the biggest party. I mean, one year ago it was established by a tiny group of people. Obviously, it didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, uh, but but today this is this is the biggest party in uh, in, in Spain. Syriza was only launched a few years ago. Before that, it was a tiny, had a few percent. What was it? Less than five percent, four percent. And now it's the main a main party. Why why is it? It's, it's not because. Uh, it, I would say like this: It's not for anything else but the massive radicalization and people looking for for a radical way out of the situation to solve uh, their problems. And to, to fight back, basically, uh, and that's the main, and that's the and that's the main thing. Um, the, the point is that in order to fight these things, the, the, the main the main tool for us to fight back is the uh, is a class based program, is a revolutionary program, not against uh, only this this one movement or this or that movement, because Pegida, uh, to be honest. It's, first of all, it's a tiny group of the usual suspects of the right who momentarily found something to unite about. And they've been supported by the media, they've been supported by the, by the bourgeoisie, but they don't have a reach within, within the population. But, we need to, but they are a symptom of the decay of capitalism. That's what they are. And we need to fight the real illness, the real disease, which is the system uh, itself. And on a class basis, and against, against the system, because if you look at it, every opportunity is there for everyone in, the, in this world, within a very short period of time, to live a very good life. Look at, look at the factories, look at the, the productive capacity in the world. In every single industry you look, is, is uh, 40, 30, 40, 50% over capacity. Why are these factories not working? Why are people unemployed when they have skills and they want to work, and there's clearly people who need things? <laughs> Uh, and there's loads of uh, raw material there to be worked, there's loads of work to be done, why is this not working? Because a tiny minority is not benef benefiting from it, because the, because the bourgeoisie, the capitalist system, the ruling class, is not benefiting from it. Uh, and that's what we have, to, we have to fight against, and that's how we can destroy this, uh, this plague of, of right-wing racism and, and Islamic fundamentalism. Thanks. Thank you.